fascinating for me is that when I began the hieroglyph upstairs, I was very aware of the feminine energy, and I, I so it was just really flowing out from Kwan Yin, this, uh, this story that was being told, and, and there was this emergence of this Christ face, this, this alchemical Christ, which I was not expecting. But it began to take me on a, a, a journey that I believe really helps us understand what seed intentionality is about. And when you look at history, you begin to realize that the journey of all the different religions and different traditions really are the development of different aspects of the human psyche. And that when we pull the world outside of us back inside of us, and we start to realize that the conversation wasn't just in our time, but actually it is the outcome of all of these times, then we'll begin to see the implication, not religiously so much of what the, the, the story of Christ is, as much as, as what we might even call the operating system of consciousness, which says that in us, introduced into us, and we can liken it to ages in our life, where we are uh, with our mother, with our father, where we are very close, where we are not separated where we turn a corner from the mother, but we're still not ready to leave home. We're still needing instruction, guidance, and a sense of direction. And then there comes a time, of course, where we, we leave, and no matter how difficult it is, we have to find our way. And when we look at the human psyche, we begin to realize that you could almost age it, meaning that there are different individuals that carry these different periods of the life. You know, so for some individuals, the idea that you would turn away from a type of parental guidance is not acceptable to them. And the point of the round table, the point of the archetypes, what I'm learning is that we have to begin to train ourselves not to judge that as right or wrong and begin to understand from a theater, theater point of view that actually it's saying that who we are as human is so vast and so remarkable and that the ages of who and what we are are manifest outside of ourselves not saying you must be this or you must be that. In a great way, like the Tibetan Book of the Dead does, it says it's about find your relationship to the light. If it is too bright, then turn and look another direction. It's not in judgment, oh, you can't take the light. It's saying, no, like an actor, you took on willingly different qualities of consciousness in order to participate in this conversation and play of what does it mean to be human. And oftentimes, if we think from that perspective, then it's not really the bad guys or the good guys or them, but we start to appreciate the fact that the theater is always present and that in our lives it is always asking us, since you can't create a world by reacting to it or being against it, then maybe you can take the pigments of the world and begin to tell a story that includes all of the ages of who and what we are. And when we do this, I really feel by nature it's like I say about a flower. I believe in the time of the blossoming, we begin to understand that you do not destroy the infrastructure of a flower. A flower blossoms from within its previous condition, meaning the bud was about keeping it in, not letting it out. And when we look at our journey, you'd say that we came through the age of the bud. Keep that imagination in you. Don't let what is in you out, because you are getting somewhere. You're growing. You're being tough. You're weathering the storm. But then a season passes in the age of a flower, and it begins to say, I'm not getting anywhere. And this constriction keeping it inside of me isn't working anymore. There's something there, and if I don't let it out, I feel like I'm going to rot on the vine. And I feel that's where we're at. There's something in us that is saying, I, I don't know what it is, but I have, to, I have to let it open. And this is why story, permission, tenderness is very important. We've brutalized ourselves up to this point because that's, in a sense, how we've prided ourselves, by taking a good beat. But we're finally saying, I think the shape has been beaten. I think the, the, the alchemy of creating the form, hardening the form is done. I don't need to harden anymore. I actually need to know that this hardness of mine, maybe, allows me to remain focused in this reality and share the context we all share. But then in the softness within me, I can finally sense, if I'm tender with my story, maybe my story will not be so afraid of me. Maybe in all of my toughness, I've terrorized this inner gentle spirit. He says, I don't know why you're so angry, but every time I'm around you, you terrify me. You're so good at being brutal. Why? 
And this is why I really feel tonight it's really about questioning in ourselves and sitting in forgiveness like we did with the ancestors and understanding that it's not our wiring. We have psychology we think is personal. We do not have personal psychology. We have human psychology we experience personally. We each are composed of the operating system. We have this key, these two eyes that have now stabilized a new right angle. And this is the solstice, meaning that we've journeyed in a way from the eyes. And you can say the journey inward, this retreating from the world, I don't like what I'm looking at, has forced us to move into the, in a sense, the darkness that finally says, now that you're in the darkness, the only way is to stand erect. And this is the solstice, meaning we finally stand holding a sense of wonder and yet an accurate understanding of shared reality. That means that no matter how daring we are imaginatively now, we will not be swept into, a, into insanity. And we do not to need to take those things that take us away from our condition, but we need to think more about how do we gather and give residence to those conditions. And that's why I wanted to just briefly so, show some of the, the journey of the seed and to talk just a little bit about planting a seed in tension because tonight our journey was about planting a seed. And in the tarot, the first, uh, the archetype of the magus, often thought of as the magician, but that to me sounded too much like prestidigitation and sleight of hand. The magus is saying that everything you plant in your mind will grow. Your brain is a womb. And therefore, if you plant toxic ideas, the toxic ideas will grow. So attend your seed. And this is why tonight I was saying those two seeds, the wish for yourself and the wish for the species, is what the Magus says, because he says, as above, so below. And you see, you are taking your shaft now, and you are driving it into this story that we are birthing now, the qualities and conditions that can hold in time the true story of the human form divine. And this is when we have this alchemy that shows us deeply that now is a seed time. We must plant the seeds of intentionality. And the next slide, which is another seed, is the seed of Eve. In, and this is called the, the delicious knowledge of Eve, forbidden fruit. But we're going to see between these two qualities of black and white and the color of masculine, the knowledge of form and the dynamic of principle, and then the knowledge of the feminine. She says, I remind you that you have forgotten because you've been dealing in black and white with your story. But I remind you now that your deeper story is life, that your first principle is feminine. Your first principle is that which says, I love all of my being. I love all of my children. And therefore, not simply like the Vitruvian man, where we're measuring all things, she says, I'm embracing the truth that all is energy. There are no evil atoms. If you don't like the stories you're telling, tell better stories. Begin with the story you're telling yourself about who you think you are. I am the mother. I love all of my children. Think of your atomic body. And it says we don't reject certain atoms of our body. We include them. And this is her story. She's saying when you understand the knowledge of matter, mater, mother, when you understand that you take the journey of black and white through form, like building a piano, you're building keys that allow you to differentiate, like the library. That's not that story, that's that story. But together, it's an instrument, it's a vehicle. And then we can also know this story, which is saying that the life principle is the principle of generosity, and that the, really this story of the deeper masculine within us is the story of desire. And we're woven of generosity and desire. And these are the seeds that we've been planting. And these were for my Codex Tour illuminated books because I didn't want to really go into them symbolically. I just wanted us to feel them because I very much sense that, that in the same way when we feel inspired, it's not something or when we brainstorm, there's just an amplification and we get excited because we're, we're problem solving, things are coming to us you know, just seemingly out of nowhere. The, we all know these energies, so it's not something alien or different that's happening. It's, again, like the flower. It's beginning to stress different values from the ones of holding on and compressing and contraction. And this is why in my journey through the codexes over 24 years, 
is I realized a lot of questions I couldn't ask with words. I couldn't figure out and get a schematic and say, oh, here, read this book. This is what you need to know. And this is what I love about the visual. It says, this is your story. Where this takes you, see what comes to you. Because the planting of the seed, the planting of the idea, will go through all different permutations and, and, and of course, environments and territories. And for me, this was using my brush and my pen as a tool of creation, to explore the nature of creation. And this really began to teach me that when we understand that we are the tools of creation and that our imagination will open worlds we can't know unless we enter them imaginatively. We won't find much of the truth of our ancientness in clay pots. It's just not a history that will be tangible on that level. The deeper history is this creative and imaginative history. And this is why a lot of people telling stories now, when you look at them not as being true or false, but in a sense an exuberance of the storyteller trying to remind us we're much more interesting than we think, then we're going to start to understand that in other times it was about which is the belief system, what is true, what do I have to attend to, who is the authority. But as we return home, we realize we are the authority. We have journeyed through all of these questions, so we wear the questions. And this is why I feel that uh, much of my story will take us, this was the fascination with the journey of the seed into the black hole, but, and then looking at the seed and its interconnectivity. Again, just where will you take me if I get out of the way and allow not the desire to illustrate something I don't know, but actually this desire to connect with a brush or a pen or a dance or a poem. Mention me. Show me what I, I cannot and do not know. And we see again the A, but this, of course, infers and gets out a sense of, of birth, I think. And the, the, the watchers that we see upstairs, what happens upstairs. So I see in all of these seed values a type of bringing forth of unique universes, unique cosmos. And what we are trying to do now is just to feel it, not to have it explained, but to really... And this is the point about, because we're talking about petroglyphs, about the, the hieroglyphic languages. That why we're attracted to petroglyphs, why we're attracted to hieroglyphic, like I was very attracted to alchemy and ancient Egyptian um, uh, uh, writing and, and, uh, and, and glyphs. Because I realized, and, and Shwala de Lubitsch gets at this, and it's a really fascinating thing, he said, said the hieroglyphic mind was not what we have in our time, which is, I'm going to make, I'm going to take abstract elements and put them together and make a concrete statement, I am going to the market, but that we would look at an image and that that would move upon us in the same way music or, or poetry moves upon us. And so that movement, that emotion, that connection was part of what was informing us. It, it, that was necessary, but like trusting one's intuition, one's inspiration, because then we could translate it into a type of story, but why it wasn't uh, a type of Fixity. It was the, the image was fixed, but it acted like a tuning fork, meaning that as this is struck, we would go around and begin to say, what does this bring to you? What does this bring to you? What does... Because in that way, the idea itself is not fixed. It's a multifaceted jewel, meaning through you, it will be a facet that we see the truth this way, and through you, we'll see it another way. And then when we would be in the circle, we realize that any question is so much more profound and interesting than just one point of view. And then when we're in relationship with each other, we start to, like an ensemble acting troupe, begin to riff on good ideas, play with them, see where they take us. That's why Stonehenge and all of the ancient sites were fixed, and we would use fire and dance and trust, like storytellers, I can't know everything. You have, you bring another piece of this treasure map. So when I dance and touch the stone and talk about the nature of creation, this is how the nature of creation manifests in me. But in you, it will be different and it will be unique. In the same way when we look at Cezanne or Michelangelo, we're looking at painting. But a very different expression in both, and yet we love both. And this is something that I feel with the Aquarian realization, the library realization, we will start to look at imagery, like for me, this, this insemination, this beauty here, um, again on a deep level, rather than an intellectual level, but more on a tonal level, 
I started to feel that what we're creating now is the technology of the imagination, the technology of beauty, meaning that our other texts were about learning because you have to sort of learn what, how the car is built, what the car does, and how many bricks you know, but, but then finally you get the keys and you go, oh, it wasn't about just building the car, it's about actually driving the car. And that's where we're at. We're done with the building. Now it's the keys. And that's one of the things why I've had a lifetime to do this. But it really is this excitement for me of sharing it with us. I say, well, what if it's just turning on a different set of, of agreements? And this is where we're going to enter now into this space of Christ that appeared in the hieroglyph of the human soul. And this is uh, very important because we're going to notice this blind eye and this open eye and the scrolls like the rabbi and the story of, as we'll see, this weave. You'll see that, that, that it's, he's woven of the watchers. He's woven of entity. Actually, I'm following this very much like a rhythmic, spontaneous weave. I don't know where it's going. And as it starts to come up in my hand, it starts to tell me a story. And it starts to tell me the story of the divided self and the blind eye of the father uh, of, of the law and the open eye of the father of love. And that we are born, and this is of course, has to do with the winter seed, the winter solstice. We think of Christmas, the celebration of, of Christ's birth, which was put there. It wasn't when he was born. It was actually about this relationship to mid uh, to winter and the planting of a seed, because the seed that was planted, and this is the mythic and archetypal element here, is that we journeyed from the story of the open eye of love, and we would turn a corner into the blind eye of the law, and in the blind eye of the law we see the scrolls, essentially meaning that <coughs> we will begin to understand ourselves with the stern father, meaning, kid, it's not personal, it's the law. This is what's expected of you. But there's an enormous <clears throat> metaphor here because my work on the tarot, which is down here in this studio, I designed this room for my father. So this becomes the sunroom designed by the, by the sun for the father where we see the archetypes in black and white. Mm -hmm. Metaphorically, symbolically, that's really important because that's the blind eye. And when we look at the symbolical significance of the house as related to the psyche, meaning that there's a footprint here, it's saying where we gathered, where we came into, was the room of shared principle, shared laws, essentially the black and white, the agreement field. When we ascend, we ascend up the stairs, we pass the domestic plane, we'll turn a corner and ascend into the living library. We will go from black and white into color. This is important as well structurally because it's saying that now that we've come home, We've understood that to be human insists upon our learning many different languages. There's the language of the kitchen, the language of the bedroom, the language of the children's room, there's the language of the living room. Of the... And, and why this is, is important is that, that it's saying that we couldn't ascend until it was connected to where we lived. Because every time we would come down from the living library, it would say, take this color, take this imaginative possibility, and realize you're still going to have to go out through the domestic play. In other words, how do we get along? How do we live together? Or you're going to have to come through this community room, which says, when we leave that, this door, and this is why in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy doesn't, it doesn't end up in color. She goes to Oz. She goes upstairs. She's vivified by a sense of, wow, there's something remarkable here. But she, what, misses home. She doesn't want to stay there. She actually wants to find her way back to, seemingly, the world of black and white. But she comes back to the world of black and white, and guess what? It's no longer just the person she was looking at, but she sees in him another character, and so much more. You see, we start to see behind the black and white a dream that might hold the color that we can't see, but we can sense it. And that's really why we start to honor this sense of this journey, this alchemical journey, that is revealed on the floor as well. Because we will start to see a relationship to the right angle. But we're going to notice with the blind eye, the open eye, the scrolls, the beard, that when we turn over this way, we start to see the seed and this alchemical alembic, meaning this type of living chalice or vase. Because the seed is going to be planted in the time of I think, therefore I am. I think we think we are not each other. We think we are separate. But this proves a very important point, which is that the waters of 
infinite generation, meaning whatever we think about on an energetic level becomes our truth. That's the great gift of consciousness. It's also the great burden and responsibility of consciousness because you say, well, you mean everything I think about becomes my truth? I says, yes. You are absolutely responsible to navigate the story of who and what you think you are with seed intention. And that's why we have to think about seed intention. It's like when you enter into acting in a role, you, you certainly don't know how to play the character, what the character even wants, and you start to attend to it, learn the lines, you start to rehearse, you say, and then something starts to grow. It really is this seed of intention that grows through attending that finally then holds our greater performance. And that's why this age of separation has been this journey of the alchemical seed that has ensheathed itself. This is also what I wanted to say, because this is really like a very large map. Um, but we're going to see this alchemical alembic that holds this seed idea that is ensheathing into this great question of, can we create a right angle? Can we hold both I think, therefore I am, meaning my unique ego, my unique identity, because when I think, I think I'm not you, with the knowledge of the open eye of love, meaning I love, therefore I am. And this has been the great test for the human story, which is the knowledge of the mother and the ancestors is I love, therefore I am, and the knowledge of the father is I think, therefore I am. And we are born of the mother and father. So they are, as Jung said, intrapsychic principles. So we're actually trying to have a good relationship in our own head, because after all, it's one being. And that's why when you're in the studio and you're standing, you're looking down, you're growing out of this. It's on the floor. And I'm convinced that this story then of this ensheathing, you see it goes over to this head here of Tor, and we see it ensheathing into this alchemical alembic that will take us on a great adventure. Why I zoomed in on Tor is this is the story of having not come from not knowing in this hieroglyph, but actually the story that we came from vast knowing, and that we had elongated, meaning that we literally had a, a, a physiology that allowed us to interconnect with the mainframe, so to speak, to be connected as a type of matrix mind. But that the, the story is that we wanted to say, well, what if we could forget? What if we could cut ourselves off from this knowing? And if you think of the line between the two hemispheres, what if we could put a mirror between the masculine and feminine? So the feminine within us would mirror its assumptions, the masculine its assumptions, until both could finally re remove the mirror and see one another. I liken this to Adam and Eve loving so, each other so much, saying that we love each other so much when we're looking at each other's eyes. But what if I turn my back on you and you turned your back on me? Would we forget? And so there's this journey away, you know, of, of really lover and beloved turning their backs on each other and truly forgetting because by the time we come full circle, we will not be entitled to lover and beloved. We will come full circle as worthy lovers and beloveds, meaning that it won't be, I, I know this because I see it. It's actually, I finally know this because through effort, I return to this. And in the return now, I stand. And this is winter solstice and the summer solstice. It's a sense I stand now as the outcome of this great sadness, this great, really, the loss of love. And now we return to the knowledge of love. And in this it says that if you can consider that, and the story here was that, that we've been on this road millions of years, 18 million years, but that, that, and that we are a technology of consciousness, that, that, that we could not be creative. When you know everything and you're elegant, you're mathematical, you're connected and you're beautiful, but to be creative, you have to be willing to forget. You have to be willing to not know what's going to happen in the next moment. And so to give up on that, and that story then, allows us to understand that in our form now, since we can't remember the next moment, how precious this moment is. And I found that when I was hugging my children and my wife, I look at them and I realize I do not know what's going to happen in the next moment or tomorrow or the next day. It makes this moment so precious, like a divine nectar. And if we can honor our entities with maybe that's what it's about, Maybe in our willingness to take on not knowing there's a heroism rather than a curse. And that we're trying to find that this is woven to this great story of love and thought. Because even here we will see the two fish of Pisces and the seed. 
meaning that when we turn and look at our journey, we've been journeying as the two brothers jealously wanting the other, what the other one had, the fish of Pisces, meaning swimming after one another, turning this seed, this possibility of love and thought, until finally we would see this story that arises with the revelation of Sophia and the truth that we are blossoming, but to do this we turned a corner. And that's why the story here in front of her belly of the infant, the child, she tells us in this myth, she says, the knowledge of Sophia, Philo Sophia, the love of wisdom, is the truth that as human you do not remember who you are. We humans are as children, we cannot remember. But in this story, because it's loving, it says there's a purpose for that. And that the reason you don't remember is you wanted to uniquely bring forth and the, the qualities of this gift of the waters of infinite generation to really know what the mind can do. And to do that, you have to be willing to enter into it without knowing beforehand what you're asking. That's why we all get into projects where you go, I thought it was going to be two weeks, and it was two years. <laughs> and I think for us, we thought it would be about 18 weeks, and it turned out to be millions of years. But I want to show this, this, this serpent, because this, this connection, this is, of course, Sophia, we see her belly, and here above her, this story of birth, this is the story of, again, the serpent, because the question was, well, what is the serpent? Why was that? And what this came to me was really interesting with my daughter, who was asking about the nature of evil and as a kid, you know, but when she was still a young, young woman. And it came to me that the serpent was actually, it became everything we, be, when we turned our back on love, when we turned away from our energetic connection with the ancestors, with Pachamama, with the earth, we became afraid of those energies. And so what was once the knowledge, because you'll see how we have the serpent's face this way, but we turn it and we see it's actually the mother and the infant, meaning that, that our own energies, which are nourishing, when we turned away from them, became serpentine, meaning we started to fear. And once you begin to fear, you begin to do what William Blake said, you begin to grow reptiles of the mind. And you begin to struggle against those reptiles that are based in fear. And the point here is that everything here is trying to say, Again, like I said upstairs with the solstice, when we shift, do you see, because this is actually shifting one perspective, and then standing directly in alignment with it, then we're informed through our energies that in alignment you will realize that what you have been fearing are your own energies. And that the way you change your fear is not to imagine that it is some serpent you are fighting, but actually it is your umbilical connection to creation you have been struggling with. And if you trust that, then what was once terrifying will become nourishing. And this is really because we reclaim from fear these things. And that's why looking at this right angle, this turning of the corner toward the mirror of unique identity and self-awareness. But the story is that there's no further to go in any of the directions. So we can now stand and hold this story of the right angle. Meaning we can look down and see this alchemical Christ seed that said the gift here was a gift that was going to take thousands of years. Because when you began to deal with the question, am I worthy of unique salvation? Am I worthy of recognition simply because I am me? And this becomes the seed that prompts the American Revolution as well, and the birth of really the Aquarian Age with William Blake and, and Goethe because we realize that, that the question we ask is layered and that the question we came in living with was this right angle of creation to finally <coughs> allow us to say that we have gotten here. And I, I really would like uh, to just repeat this. I asked for tonight's talk. I said, well, what, what is it that, that is most important really for us to take away? And I, lo I love this because it's like, you are here for this moment, this world, this dream. Actually, yeah, let's say this out loud. Yeah, yeah, let's say it out loud. You are here for this moment, this world, this dream. Plant your seed intentions of worthiness and knowing. You are celestial partners, ancient partners of creation, and you are finding your way home together. That's essential, oh, wow. essential. Say that as a mantra, because what we're doing is, in a way, 
dissolving the Piscean agreement through affirming a different set of possibilities. So the last two slides I'd like to say out loud, and and just again um, to feel it, let it open, and then we will we will uh, say yay and be done. Um, but uh, or if there's questions, of course, I, I promise I won't go on too long. Um, but let's say this together: Generosity of heart sets our wisdom, love and beauty free. Be generous, love deeply. Proclaim beauty loudly and rejoice with the time of loving is upon us. Let the Renaissance begin with me. Shall be our honor. And the final one is, is really this, this blessing to the ancestors. And when we're saying it, let's just really stand in a solstice alignment. Feel that sense of your roots. Just take a moment, breathe. Feel your roots, feel your, yourself going down into the earth, and, and that you are really allowing your roots to nourish you. It's not something, it's like love, it's just saying, I like this story better. I like being connected to my roots better. May my roots connect, may I connect with my roots. And now as I say thank you to the ancestors, let's... To the ancestors and ancients. To the family tree, to all who have gone before and are to come, to our sacred Gaia, our dear Mother Earth, and her generous heart, we send our love, our gratitude, our forgiveness of one another and of ourselves. We express here and now our willingness to be finally worthy of this great gift and responsibility of being the human form divine. Let us share from across the ages our most loving and creative stories of being human simply because we can. so personal now, it's not like what's wrong with you or what your, what's your baggage, it's like, it's almost like throw them, you know, it's like, eh, I, gotta, I really just want to understand this sense of maybe, because things on a quantum level as well, you know, we know that the, we affect the experiment you know, scientifically, you know, so it doesn't have to be just, you know, and then oftentimes there's this reason to believe it. Uh, but I really do, I feel, play the quantum. Because if you think from the creative and imaginative, you know, you've always got the blank canvas, but what you do is you just say, well, what if I am? What if I, what will happen if? Where will this take me? And I really feel like we've got to trust that in ourselves more and more, and as we do, it'll simply build in a quantum state the energies of that trust. You know, it's almost like whatever we put into the system is what builds the system now. So, uh,